Father, if you had not loved us first, we would still be refusing you. Father, I pray as we open your word this morning that your truth would go out and it would not return void. Lord, I know that there are hard truths in this text. It's hard to wrap our minds around, our emotions. I pray for people right now sitting individually in their seats that as the word hits them this morning that the emotion that will be caused would be worship, not doubt or anger. Lord, I know that we want to be a church that's sitting under the authority of your word because in your word we have your truth. It's, it's, it's not just a title, your word. It's literal. It's, this is your very breath given to us. And we want to be under the authority of it. But God, I know there are some things in the Bible that it is it's harder than others to submit to the authority of your word. And Lord, I pray in this moment right now that your spirit would work in all of our hearts. That we would be ready to submit to the authority of your word. And to joyfully see the good you have in it. Lord, I'm not sufficient for this time. No man is, but your grace is sufficient in the working of your spirit, and that's exactly what I pray for. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. In Christ's name, amen. Well, please turn in your copy of God's holy and perfect word to Titus chapter 1. This morning we are beginning a brand new study through the letter the Apostle Paul wrote to Titus. For most of 2020 up to this point, we have been in the Old Testament, going through Daniel, a handful of the Psalms, but now it's time to head back to the New Testament and see a letter written to a young pastor named Titus. And I'm excited to explore this letter with you this morning and in the coming weeks because of the subjects that will be covered, uh, that Paul covers to Titus. I don't think we'll have any problem identifying with the things that he says. I mean, whereas when we study Daniel, we are not Israelites in captivity under Babylonian rule. When we studied a handful of Psalms, we are not King David on the run from our son. There were certainly things that we applied, no doubt, but as we come to Titus, we are a New Testament church trying to live under the commands of the Bible in obedience to Jesus. This letter is immediately applicable to us. I don't think we'll have any problem seeing that. Paul is concerned in his letter to Titus. He wants Titus to see as he is communicating these truths to the churches there, he is concerned for healthy churches, holding strong to biblical truth and refuting doctrinal error, trusting in the finished work of Jesus and living out lives of godliness. This is why I've titled the study, Titus grace-fueled godliness because Jesus died to enable his church to live out the commands of Scripture, to live out lives of holiness and, and godliness. He enables us to do that so that we can be different from the world. And do we ever need a people to live differently than the world we see all around us? Jesus intends for the people he died for to be enabled by his grace to grow in Christ-likeness. So, in this letter, Paul will address how we as a church should be organized 
how we as a church should function, what we as a church should believe, what we as a church should be doing, how we should be acting in the world. I mean, we're living in a time, in a culture, in a nation where you can go to any corner, any city almost, in our nation and there's a church on every corner. But sadly, for the majority of them, they are either on life support or they are strung out on culture philosophies that have nothing to do with what God has actually said in his word. It's hard to find a church that's organized according to God's instruction, filled with people who are seeking to grow like Christ in conduct and in character. And the world is tired. I'm, I'm tired of religious institutional buildings being the representation of the church. The world's numb to just this labeled religiosity. They need salt, something that will stand out and be different than what, el what else is around us. They need genuine, gospel-saturated, Bible-devoted, God-centered, love for neighbor, concerned for holiness people. It's what Paul calls Titus 2 and the churches in Crete. It's what he calls us to. So my, my excitement for this letter is one where it's like, let's, let's go because this is, this is what call, Paul is calling us to. In 2020, right here, Greer, Duncan, Lyman, Woodruff, Spartanburg, Greenville, this is what we are called to. This is a perfect timing for us to be the church that God has called us to. So, as we start studying this letter, my encouragement for you would be come every week expecting to be shaped by the Bible in ways that we are not yet shaped. If you look at the first four words, or the first words of verse 1, 4, and 5, you will see the general setting for this letter. Verse 1 identifies the author as Paul. Verse 4 tells us that he's writing to Titus. And verse 5 tells us where Titus is located, in Crete. Crete is a small island in the Mediterranean Sea, southeast of Rome, west of Jerusalem, north of Africa. In Acts 2.11, we actually see that some Cretans were at Pentecost, and this is perhaps where some of them heard the gospel for the first time and believed and possibly took their faith back to their home island of Crete. But there were also some who heard the message, went back to their home island, and began to distort the message. And by this time, Titus had been a co-worker of Paul on his missionary journeys over the years. It would appear that Paul actually led Titus to the faith. You can see in verse 4 that Paul calls him his true child in the faith. But after traveling with Paul for some time now, Titus will stay on the island of Crete to be a young pastor to continue to establish the health of these churches in the region. And this is the setting we see at the beginning of the letter, Paul writing to Titus located in Crete. But you can see in the verses there, verses 1 through 4, there's a lot more meat in the greeting than simply that. In fact, this is one of Paul's longest greetings in his, letter, in his letters in the New Testament. And it's to the rest of that greeting there that I'm devoting this sermon. So look with me in Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior.
Now, normally, I like to give you the main point of the message and then walk through it verse by verse, but how do you preach a greeting to a letter? That's what I wrestled with this week in my study. I think there are several fundamental truths that we can learn from this greeting. And I think the best way to accomplish this is just to simply walk through the verses, applying as we go. So Paul's greeting here can be broken down into three parts. Paul's role, Paul's work, and Paul's goal. His role, work, and goal. So first consider Paul's role. Verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul calls himself first a servant of God, which is actually unique here for Paul. He doesn't refer to himself as a servant of God anywhere else in the New Testament in his letters. He usually refers to himself as a servant of Jesus Christ or an apostle of Jesus Christ, which he also does here. But it's here specifically he adds a servant of God. This title wasn't popular for Paul, but it is popular throughout the Bible. And we see, especially in the Old Testament, countless people who are called servants of God. From Moses to David to Isaiah to Jeremiah, just to name a few, all who were called refer to themselves as servants of God, which raises the significance now of Paul calling himself a servant of God because now he is putting himself in the long line of faithful saints who served at the call of Yahweh. This is what a servant of God does. He devotes his life to the mission of God. And there's a general sense that we all are servants of God if you are in Christ. A very general sense, just as 1 Corinthians 6 20 says that we are not our own, but we have been bought with a price. To be freed from sin is to be freed to service to the king. This is what we were made to do. Paul is not writing to accomplish his own plan or agenda. He writes in full service to God who has given him a mission. But he also calls himself, you'll see in verse 1, an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is typical for Paul in his letters. An apostle was someone who saw and encountered Jesus personally and was commissioned by Jesus directly. This is why there are no more apostles today. Instead, Jesus has given the church his written word to govern us. A word that he used the apostles to establish, to write. Ephesians 2.20 refers to the church as being built upon the apostles and the prophets where Jesus is the cornerstone. So because we have the completed word of God from the prophets and the apostles through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we need no more apostles because we have the completed word here. Paul's titles in verse 1 indicate that his words written carry the authority of God. He's a servant of God. He's a commissioned apostle of Jesus. And so the question becomes, if he is a servant of God and if he is commissioned by Jesus, what is his service to perform and what has he been commissioned to do? This leads us to the second point. Paul's work. What was the purpose of Paul's work to Titus and in general for that matter? Notice verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for, that's the purpose there, for, and he gives us three purposes, the sake of the faith of God's elect for their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, implied their godliness. So he is working, he's writing for the faith of God's elect, their knowledge of the truth, and their godliness. Three purposes that he is on a mission to accomplish. This is the, the role that he has for all Christians, for their faith, 
that they would grow in knowledge of the truth, that they would live godly lives. Now, before we, we talk about those three purposes, we need to look at this issue of God's elect. Paul says it in passing here, just as a title given. It's not the main point of this passage, but I'm afraid that the church as a whole in recent years especially, and maybe as a whole in church history, has lacked teaching on this subject. What does he mean by for the sake of the faith of God's elect? Who is he referring to as God's elect? Well, simply put, the easy answer is the term God's elect refers to the church. Who is the church? All those who are in Christ, trusting in the finished work of Christ. We see a similar language used in Romans 8.33 where Paul says, who shall bring charge against God's elect? Again, speaking of believers, but that doesn't really answer our question. Why does he call them the elect? Why not the believers or the church or those who are in Christ? Why elect? And frankly, that's the question that's often avoided. I don't know how familiar you are with this subject of election. Unfortunately, it's been controversial over the years, mainly because of a misunderstanding. And because it's been so controversial, it has led many churches just to avoid the subject altogether. And because of this mass avoidance, it has robbed God's church of seeing a beautiful and central dimension of God's grace. Now, I say central because of its consistent teaching throughout all of Scripture and church history for that, for that matter. Even the reformers in the Protestant Reformation who were bringing the church back to the Bible, the reformers called this doctrine of election, quote, the heart of the church. And we have clearly come a long way from that point in time where they said this is the heart of the church to now we don't even approach the subject. It comes up in the text for the faith of God's elect. And so because of the lack of teaching, I think, often on this subject, I want to I address it head on. To understand the biblical category of election you must first understand the undeserving state of mankind. When Adam and Eve chose to sin against God, and God said the penalty for their sin would be death, separation from him, and because of their sin, as a result, all of mankind was plunged into their sinful nature, also receiving the penalty of eternal death. This is why you and I sin, because it's our nature to sin. And this is why death exists, because it's the global penalty for all of mankind's sin against a holy God. Romans 5, 12 makes this clear. It says, therefore, just as sin entered, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. We do not become sinners by sinning. We sin because we are sinners by nature. We are born with this. We often talk about the church needing to guard against false teaching in the church. And there are some low-hanging fruit that we often pick at, like the prosperity gospel, we need to refute such teaching, or other doctrines that hit mainline stream media that, you know, everybody looks at and the evangelical church knows that's against God's word. But I would say to you 
that perhaps maybe the most prominent false teaching that's popularized and unnoticed in the church today teaches this, man is basically good. That teaching alone brings massive waves of false ideas into the church. It's completely against what scripture says. The, the Bible is clear. Man is not good. Man is totally depraved. The psalmist says in Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin did my mother conceive me. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart of man is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Jesus said when he came into the world, people rejected him because they loved the darkness over the light because their works are evil, John 3, 19. Ephesians 2 speaks of the fact that we are dead in our sin, following the prince of the air, being by nature, catch it, by nature children of wrath, it says. This is the testimony of all of Scripture. Man is not good within and of ourselves. We are, we are sinners who have chosen to rebel against God. We have stiff-harmed Him in His face. And God would be perfectly just to judge us on the spot right now in our sin. I mean, this is an even ground of guiltiness. There's no one better, more righteous than the other. The ground of guiltiness is flat. We all stand on it. Romans 3.10 says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. But we as men and women like to call for fairness. And fairness is a good thing, but be careful when we demand that God be fair to us above all. Because if God were fair to us right now, in this moment, we would all be in hell in a second. Because we deserve that. Because of our sin that we have committed out of our sinful nature. God God does not owe us anything. We are not born with rights that God must honor. If God never gave us one more provision in our life, we would already have a lifetime full of provisions that we did not deserve from God. Every breath outside of hell is a gift of grace from God. This is the state of mankind, born into sin, choosing to rebel against God, deserving of the punishment of hell that awaits us. And if you don't believe that, just ask yourself, what should God do with all of your sin? Should he just overlook it? And would we want a judge to overlook? Just, just listen to the cries of our nation right now. Would someone want a judge to overlook the crimes of someone committed when they deserve punishment? If a judge overlooked them, we would call for justice for that judge because we would know it was wrong. So what is God supposed to do with our sin? He cannot overlook it or he would be unjust. What criminal with a long list of proven crimes in his right mind would stand before a judge after receiving his sentence and say, I don't deserve that or that's not fair when we know he does deserve it and it is fair. See, the really scary fact is we are the criminals and God is the judge. 
all of us deserve the sentence. And God doesn't owe us anything. In order to understand the doctrine of election, you must start there. Because if you start from a position believing that God owes us something, we'll look at the lens, we'll look at the doctrine of election through the, the wrong lens. Two of my favorite words in the Bible are but God. But God in his infinite wisdom. But God, whose ways are higher than our ways, I'll remind us all, but God, for reasons outside of ourselves, planned before time, that for the sake of his own glory, he graciously and mercifully planned to save a people from his wrath for himself. This is the people of God's elect. And it's a people that's not based upon race or nationality or righteousness. In fact, the Bible says the people are made up of individuals from every tribe, race, nationality, and tongue. This people he chose, he appointed to save are called God's elect. He looked at the sea of humanity who were rightfully deserving of our path to hell and he saw us destined to wrath and in his grace before time began, he predestined some would be saved by his grace, not because they were better or more deserving than others, but simply because of his mercy. Now I know, I know this doctrine of election is hard to wrap our minds around and our emotions and our logic. There was a time where when I would see scripture and I would just come red faced mad. There was a time that I would see scripture related to the doctrine of election and it drove me to the point where it said, I don't want to have anything to do with the church. Or with God for that matter. I know it's hard to wrap our emotions, our logic around, but the Bible does not lack clarity concerning this issue. God left no doubt as to what he meant concerning this doctrine. The stakes are too high for him to be vague on this point. He has been clear. The Bible even goes as far as answering our common objections that it knows that we will have. So here's, here's the bottom line issue for us all in this moment when we come to something like this. It's hard to s grasp in scripture. We must submit to the authority of God's word over our initial logic or feelings. And just so, I want you to, I want you to, feel the tidal wave of God's word on this for a second. We see a pattern all throughout scripture of election. We see it start in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says to the Israelites, God's chosen people, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. That's that's all over the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see Jesus teach explicitly on this topic. In John 6, 37, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So who comes to Jesus? All that the Father gives to him John 10, 25, Jesus is speaking to the non-believing Pharisees and he says, quote, I did tell you, but you didn't believe. Well, why didn't they believe? The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Now notice he did not say, you are not of my sheep because you don't believe. He says, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. 
John 15, 16, Jesus said to the 12, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. In Acts 13, 48, Paul is preaching to the, the gospel to a crowd and Luke says, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. In Ephesians 1, Paul writes about the blessings given to God's church and in Chapter 1, verse 4 through 6, he writes, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. The doctrine of, God, the doctrine of God's election is all over Scripture. The amount of evidence is simply overwhelming. And frankly, I don't know what to do with texts like these and tens of hundreds of others that teach this. Well, what are we to do with texts like this? Other than to read and believe them for what they say. The doctrine of God's election highlights the abundantly gracious action of God toward undeserving rotten sinners to which there's no room for boasting because he didn't elect the church because they deserved it. He elected the church because of his mercy. If, if you're in Christ today, there is nothing within you that brought that about. I mean, just think for a moment, just logically, why is it that you believe today and your friend doesn't perhaps? Is it because of your goodness or your knowledge or your wisdom? It's not because you were smarter, it's not that you were more deserving. It's not even because of your will. John 1.13 speaks about the children of God and it says, they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. So how were they born? But of God. It's just a tidal wave of scripture pointing to the grace of God. So why did he save us? Have you ever just thought for a second, just you individually, why did God save you? Why do you believe? Where did that come from? And if you try to come up with an answer within yourself, you don't have any. Like we, I don't know other than God's, was just gracious. I was on my path to hell, destined and for his wrath, deserving of it. And he graciously saved me from that. And it's just a wonderful truth to just rest in. It's amazing that God would give us such grace when he didn't have to. Now I want to be clear because I know how hard this is. God's election of sinners does not negate other core biblical truths such as the need to exercise repentance and faith to be saved. Listen, the Bible teaches if you do not repent of sins and trust in Jesus, you will not be saved. His election doesn't negate the need to evangelize the lost. Please hear me very, clear, clear, hear me very clearly. People will not be saved unless they hear the gospel and respond to the gospel. And people will not hear the gospel and respond to the gospel unless we speak the gospel. No one's getting saved without hearing and believing. His election doesn't cancel the truth to share it with every single person. It doesn't cancel the truth that, that God desires for all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4. That is a genuine desire of God. He wants people, all people, he says, to be saved. It doesn't negate the truth that God doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, 2 Peter 3.9. That's a genuine desire of God. It doesn't negate the truth that we should share the gospel with every single person without exception. All those teachings are just as true as the doctrine of God's election. And if you're unsure how those type things 
fit with the doctrine of elections, the Bible is full of answers for you. And, and really, I would love to help you walk through and, and think through how these things fit together. But for the purposes of this text, we must not explain away what God's Word clearly says and confirms throughout all of Scripture. That the individual makeup of the church did not originate or develop merely from the choice of man, but from the choice of God. He could have used any other word to describe God's believer here in Titus 1, but he chose elect, pointing to his work of God, his work on behalf of undeserving people. And people ask, how do I know if I'm part of the elect? Well, the answer is easy. Are you trusting in Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Do you believe in the core truths of Jesus' work on the cross and resurrection? Because remember, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Which means, have you come to Jesus in faith? If so, Jesus promises you today, he will never cast you out. Which also means, if you want to come to Jesus, he will not turn you away. Anyone Anyone can come to Jesus and he will welcome them in and adopt them to be his brothers and sisters. If you've never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the invitation is extended to you today, to anyone listening, to anyone listening online. The invitation is extended Come to Jesus, and if you come, he stands ready to forgive you and to embrace you, any and all, any and all who come, he will welcome in. Now, I realize that I've spent much of our time on those two words, God's elect, and they're not the main point of this text, but I don't think we could understand this text properly unless we know who Paul's talking to here. He says this is the purpose of his work for the faith of God's elect, for their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. I know I just have just a little time left. Like I've used up most of the time, just a little bit of time left. So listen quickly. Paul's working for the believers in three ways here, all of which are critically important. First, he says, for the, faith, for the sake of their faith, he's working so that God's church would hear the message of the gospel and respond in faith. And he's working for those who have already responded so that they would continue in the faith, that they would grow stronger. And everything we do as a church should be with this in mind. Are we serving to seek the salvation of others? Are we sharing the gospel in a way for the sake of the faith of God's elect? One of the disappointments for me when COVID-19 hit was the fact that it brought to a screeching halt some of the plans that I was wanting to do and introduce with the church. One of which centered around our evangelism strategy, how we will reach others you know, even though we haven't been able to meet normally and still we can't meet normally, we can still have the gospel on our lips ready to share for the sake of the faith of others. But we also have to be committed for the sake of the faith of those already here. This is why discipleship must be one of our core values. Evangelism is simply a door into discipleship. It serves the purpose of discipleship. So the question that I would pose for all of us to consider, are we serving and seeking ways to disciple others for the sake of their faith? Are you being discipled in some way so that you can then disciple others? Paul said he's working for the sake of their faith. The second reason of Paul's work is for their knowledge of the truth. You can see that in verse 1. For the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. God doesn't simply want people to be saved. He wants people to be saved and then once saved to be growing in their knowledge of the truth. I quoted 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 earlier. Listen what it says again. God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 
This is why in our normal gatherings on Sunday mornings, we have the hour before corporate worship, the core class Bible study hour, where we intentionally seek to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. And in the coming weeks, whenever it is that we're able to gather with some normalcy again, we'll seek to be even more intentional about classes that we're offering, when and how, so that we can be intentional and strategic about growing in the knowledge of, of God. That's why I would say to you, if, if you are committed to the worship service, but not necessarily a core class or Bible study hour, when we start back sometime, I just remind you that God puts a premium on growing in the knowledge of Him, and the core class hour is a perfect time for that. And then finally, Paul ties the two together. It says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. This is the third part of his work. He's concerned for the church's godliness. And here's the thing. There is a danger in picking the first two and leaving off the last. Many of our, our culture want faith of some sort. We want to believe in something Even others have something to believe in and they grow in their facts about God, but does it impact their life? To be honest, in the Bible Belt, it is popular to have faith. Almost everyone wears the label. And many even go to church where they grow in their knowledge. But how many are truly concerned with godliness? Paul says you cannot break the chain of these three components and still have saving faith. Faith without knowledge is a hollow faith. It's just going along with the crowd. It's like taking the flyer on the street and never reading it. Knowledge without true, knowledge without truth, or excuse me, knowledge of the truth without faith is demonic. Think about it. Satan and his demons have all the truth they could ever want and they hate it. No faith in it. And finally, faith and knowledge of the truth without godliness is a fake faith. James calls it a dead faith. This is perhaps the most dangerous one because it's one that believes in public, knows all the right answers in the heart, but has never shaped their life. They live in deception, thinking all is well when it's not. They want Jesus to be their Savior, but not their Lord. Paul says godliness accords with or is consistent with true faith and knowledge of the truth. So to be clear, godliness cannot save you. Only grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone does that. But if you, the faith that you have, if you have a faith that has not produced the fruit of godliness, the scripture points to the fact that Your faith is not true saving faith. This is why Paul writes and works. This is why we should work as a church to see disciples grow in their faith, grow in their knowledge, manifesting in the life of godliness. It's salt in a decaying world, light in darkness. So here's how I want to close this morning. That last section in, in Titus 1 through 4. He says its role in his work. Finally, and very quickly notice his goal. Verse 1, for the the faith of the elect, for their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life. This is the end result of God's church, living eternal life, in eternal life with him. Paul's hope is, is not a wishful thinking hope like, I hope it happens, but I'm not sure if it's going to happen until I see it. No, it is a guaranteed surety that it will come. Notice the text says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. This is how this whole text comes together. It comes full circle here. And if you can grasp this, I think it's going to encourage your heart as a believer. Before time began, God designed eternal life for his people. And we say, well, how could he promise eternal life to people who never, who hadn't been born yet? How can he promise eternal life to people who hadn't believed yet? 
Verse 1, because he had in his mind an elect to give it to. I hope you can feel the assurance you have as a believer that God promised two things in eternity before time. That there would be an eternal life and there would be, an, there would be a people to enjoy it. And how, does, how do the two meet? Paul says in the rest of, in verse 3, that God at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching which he had been entrusted. So here's how it all comes together. God planned eternal life for a people and how does he get them there? He sends a servant of God, Paul, to preach a message delivered in his word and when they hear the word, they grow in faith, grow in knowledge which accords with godliness and they become a people who fit eternal life that God planned in advance. So if you're a believer this morning, your eternity is secure, not because you're holding it, but because God planned it. He gave you the faith for it. He's growing you in knowledge for it and in godliness. And one day you will see it as a reality. So two takeaways. Worship God in light of the work he has planned, accomplished, and ultimately will finish for you as a believer. And second, let's get to work and join the movement that pushes along the plan of God for the sake of the faith of God's elect. Let's pray. God, we are so indebted to you as a gracious and merciful God. Thank you that you gave the message of eternal life in your word and you have sent servants, messengers with that message on their lips. All of us, Lord, who are believers in the room, we can think of how we heard the message of the gospel, likely through some sort of preacher or servant or friend or family member or maybe just picking up the very word itself and reading it. And when we did, you ignited faith within us Faith you had planned and faith that you will bring to the eternal life you also had planned. We are so indebted to your grace. So I pray, God, that as we consider these things that it would induce worship within us and we would realize just how marvelous your mercy is. Help us in that, oh God, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.